You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible Peace and War 1 Kings 20 verse 18 Jeremy Thompson pointed out on Facebook an interesting verse in 1 Kings 20 18 where Ben-Hadad, king of Damascus, having had a bit too much to drink, when Israel comes out for battle, says, If they've come for peace, take them alive. If they've come for war, take them alive. Which, as far as stirring pre-battle speeches go, is lacking a certain something. My first thought was that there might be some interesting textual variants here. At the very least, attempts to correct the apparently strange Hebrew. But there don't seem to be. Next, I tried a bunch of commentaries, first on Google Books, and then in the Laidlaw Library, because I was teaching a postgraduate intensive on Isaiah, so I had access to the library. But hardly anyone among the modern commentators mentions this verse at all. So, looking back at the traditional Jewish readers, things began to get marginally more interesting. Red Axe suggests that, though the meaning is the same, the word order has been changed. Because in Hebrew the text reads, Im le shalom yasa'u tipesum chayim ve im le milchama yasa'u chayim tipesum If for peace they have come out, you shall seize them alive. And if for war they have come out, alive you shall seize them. Because Ben Haddad wanted to avoid sounding repetitious. I think not. Ben Haddad is a drunken foreign pagan king. I doubt those who recorded his words wanted to take trouble to avoid making him sound repetitious. The nineteenth century Jewish scholar Malbim has logic on his side, reckoning that Ben H. wants to draw attention in each case to the first word of the result clauses. If for peace they have come out, seize them alive. And if for war they have come out alive, you shall seize them. On the other hand, this still doesn't explain the motivation. Abrabanel, however, seems more attuned to the text, suggesting that the reversal is intended to portray the Aramean king's tipsy state. Those medieval rabbis often provide sensitive and suggestive clues to the literary intentions and suggestions of Bible stories. Looking into all this, I also found really interesting their careful reading of the passage that leads up to this fight. The passage begins when Ben-Hadad gathers an army, including thirty-two junior kings, and marches against Samaria. The message he sends to Ahab, and Ahab's reply, also seems strange. Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and gold are mine, your fairest wives, and your children also are mine. The king of Israel answered, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. Something weird's going on here. The two kings don't seem to be speaking the same language and several of the commentators note this because Ahab apparently thinks he's simply accepting Aramean overlordship while Ben-Hadad seems to think he's announcing his intention to take everything note the mention of the fairest wives and children Redak and the Targum Jonathan take the Ki'im opening of verse 6 to mark Ben-H's correcting of this misunderstanding Rashi goes even further and notes that the threat to take anything desirable in your eyes suggests that by comparison the things silver, gold, wives, children that were mentioned earlier were not as desirable as some treasure that Ahab is refusing. What treasure could this be? It can only be a Sefer Torah, a book of the law. And in this Rashi is reflecting the claim in the Talmud that Ahab's longevity as a king is due to his respect for the Torah. Remember he reigned for twenty-two years, the same number as the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet that were used to write the Torah. It's fascinating stuff. Reading the rest of the characterization of Ahab in the Book of Kings, I'm not quite convinced that uh, we can whitewash the king in this way. But it certainly points up an interesting disparity in the words and the points of view of these two kings that we might have glossed over and failed to notice if we didn't pay careful attention to the wording and that careful attention to the wording is just what the Jewish rabbis offer us no deep theological meaning today but a bit of fun with a rather dull Bible text enjoy having a read and catching some of the, the nuances that are going on here 
Bye for now.